All right, we have our exam on Friday. And for the second half of lecture today, we'll review for that. Lecture 21B and 21A, we will talk a little bit more about internal direct products. Then more about chapter 10, group homomorphisms, kernels, properties, first isomorphism theorem, and another theorem that says that all normal subgroups are kernels. Quick reminder though that exam two is this Friday. The majority will be chapters five through 10. I know, I know the first exam went through all of chapter five, and even a tiny bit of chapter six. But I think it's re re worth re-emphasizing the importance of chapter five about permutation groups. And especially thinking about those problems where you have to count the number of elements of various orders and maybe a little bit more complicated than the quiz questions related to that. Um, as something that could show up on exam two. Earlier stuff could come up. In particular, I'm thinking of certainly being able to do modular arithmetic, subgroup tests, cyclic groups, and examples of groups and subgroups like, for example, centers of groups. It'll be, again, closed book, closed notes, no calculator. If you do have to do any modular arithmetic calculations, it'll be something not too bad. You technically could even go back to what you did in what fourth or fifth grade if you need to as far as multiplication goes. Um, I'll try to make it something where you can, it's not too bad to do by hand. All right, internal direct products. You've got external direct products and internal direct products. What's the difference? Well, there is a difference between them, but they are related. You say that a group G is an internal direct product of subgroups. G is the whole group, H and K are subgroups of G, internal to G. And we write G equals H cross K. If H and K are, first of all, normal, they do need to be normal. <clears throat> Secondly, G equals H, K, meaning, always remind yourself what this means, every element of G is the product of something in capital H times something in capital K, with the thing in capital H on the left and the thing in capital K on the right. The intersection of H and K is trivial, just the identity. Uh, this is not part of the definition, but a quick consequence of this is that, in fact, every element of capital G can be represented in a unique way as a product of, element, of an element of H times an element of K. Before we get into the proof that internal direct products are isomorphic to external direct products, I think it's worth mentioning and re-emphasizing that this is analogous to the idea of a, a two-dimensional vector space. We, I am considering the simplest case, of course, here, where we've just got two subgroups. You read about situations where you've got a, a group being the internal or a product of an arbitrary number of subgroups, arbitrary finite number. I'm focused on the case of two. It's analogous to a set of two linearly independent vectors being a basis of two-dimensional vector space. <clears throat> One of the vectors would be a basis for H, and one of the vectors would be a basis for K. And they're linearly independent, essentially, is what means the intersection is trivial. And it turns out in linear algebra, every in such a situation, every vector can be written as a linear combination of those two basis vectors, or two-dimensional vector space. So it's analogous to that. And the theorem is, if H is the internal, if G is the internal direct product of H and K, then in fact G is isomorphic to the external direct product of H and K. This is a different thing. It is a different group. The elements of this group, always remember, are ordered pairs, right? H comma K inside parentheses. The elements of G, as an abstract group, are not ordered pairs. What's the proof of this? Here's an outline of the proof. There's four main steps. Step one is to show that an element of H and an element of K, arbitrary elements, actually commute with each other. Use the normality of H and K to show that arbitrary elements of these subgroups commute. Step one turns out to be necessary in the simplest case of the internal direct product of two subgroups. For step four, though when you read the book's more general proof about the internal direct product of n subgroups, 
it's also necessary for the next step, step two. How would you show arbitrary elements of H and K commute? This is your goal to show that little h and little k, arbitrary ele elements of capital H and capital K commute. I'm not really going to do a proof here. I'm just going to think things through. This is like going to be scratch work. What would that be equivalent to? That would be equivalent to, for example, if I multiply both sides of this equation on the right by H inverse. to this fact, and then if I multiply both sides on the right by k inverse, that would be equivalent to this fact. So if I've got two arbitrary elements, little h and little k, of capital H and capital K, to show that commute, I could show this is true. Hmm. How are you going to do that? Well, you need the normality of H and K. Let's come over here. Let me write this expression like this. Use parentheses for emphasis. Capital K is normal in G. What does that mean? Well, by the normal subgroup test, it would mean this is true for all X and G since capital K is normal in capital G. H, in this expression, inside the parentheses, is acting like the X. Little k is an element of capital K. By this fact, which is going to be true, because I'm assuming K is normal, this expression is going to be an element of capital K. That's a consequence of the normality. So the product here is going to be an element of this right cosine. But hey, little k and therefore little k inverse is in capital K. It gets sucked in. This equals capital K. So in fact, this thing is an element of capital K. Hmm. Is it also an element of capital H? I mean, H and K are kind of arbitrary anyway. Well, yeah. Think of it this way. Group the elements this way. By the normality of H, capital H, that's an element of capital H. I can say the same kind of thing is true for capital H. <clears throat> Since capital H is normal in capital G. So this product is therefore in the left coset, little h, capital H. And little h is an element of capital H. So this is the same as capital H itself. It gets sucked in, <coughs> absorbed by capital H. Does this have a point? Am I going? Where, where am I going with this? What was my goal again? Hold that. I mean, show that. Am I? Am I done? Is this? Does this do it? Claim yes. Why? Why do these two facts imply that this equals the identity? Come back to this slide. What in this slide helps us say that that product is the identity? It's something in this slide here. Yeah, I didn't quite hear you well, but I think you said this is, this is the case. Intersection of H and K is trivial. It's part of the assumption of what's going on in the background to be an internal or direct product. So this is true since the intersection of H and K is just the identity. Okay, so that's going to do step one. Arbitrary elements of capital H and capital K can you? And that will be necessary for step four. What's step two? Show what I said um, on the preceding slide. 
actually. Every element of capital G can be written uniquely as an element of capital H times an element of capital K. H times K word. Yeah. I mean, I, since elements of H and K commute, I could write it the other way around. I could write it as K times H. But the H and K themselves are unique. Well, you could assume there's maybe two representations of little g as an element of capital H times capital K. What would it take for H1 to equal H2 and K1 to equal K2 here? Well, first of all, this would be equivalent, if I assume this is true, to, for example, once again, do something similar. Multiply both sides by, on the left, say, by H2 inverse. And then multiply both sides on the right, maybe, by K2 inverse. It doesn't really matter, actually. This fact being true, would be equivalent to this. Now I'm assuming this, and my goal here is to show uh, H1 equals H2. And I was thinking about this before class for long, not remembering what I was thinking. Actually, it's better to it's better to do something else here. It's better to, for example, solve this equation for say, k1, k2 inverse. Let me sort of go backwards here now. Let me multiply both sides on the left by h2 inverse h1. I'm doing more steps than I really needed to do. If I do that, I will have solved the equation for k1, k2 inverse. It'll be the inverse of H2 inverse H1. Some typos in here. Which, by the sock shoes property, would this be the same as H1 inverse H2. But the point is, this is an element of capital K, and this is an element of capital H, and they're equal to each other. They must both be the identity. Since once again, H intersect K is the identity. And that's going to imply, since this is the identity, that K1 equals K2. And since this is the identity, H1 equals H2. So in fact, it's unique. So I did extra steps. I should have maybe just solved for k1, k2 inverse right away. Make a mistake. Does this look good? Yeah, OK. I should have just solved for that right away. Does it look good to people, no mistakes? Step three. Define the candidate isomorphism. I actually, I told you this last week. What should phi map an arbitrary element of G to? Well, since an arbitrary element of G can be written in a unique way as some little h times some little k, I can write a formula for phi where my input is represented that way. So based on step two, based on the fact that I can write everything in G in a unique way as something in H times something in K, I can write the formula for phi this way. And the most natural thing to map it to is this, that ordered pair. And that's what we do. Step four is to verify this is an isomorphism. So it's one to one on to an operation preserving. Not a homomorphism, an isomorphism. 
got to be one to one and on to as well. Is it one to one? If you assume this was true, that would imply this is true. And the only way for two ordered pairs to be equal is if their components are equal. H1 must equal H2 and K1 must equal K2, which implies that H1 times K1 equals H2 times K2. And this would show that phi is one to one. Right? If the inputs are if the outputs are the same, the inputs must have been the same. Phi is pretty clearly on to, right? I won't even bother writing it down, let me just say it. Given an arbitrary ordered pair in that external direct product, what gets mapped to it? Just take the product of the components. Given h comma k, h times k gets mapped to it. And is phi operation preserving? Yeah, but you do need, step one, you do need the fact that arbitrary elements commute. I've got two arbitrary elements, H1, K1, and H2, K2. And yes, I, mean, I meant to say the elements in capital H and the elements of capital K commute. By the way, H and K themselves are not necessarily abelian. So H1 might not commute with H2, and K1 might not commute with K2. I guess I gotta be careful here. Yeah. By the associative property and the commutative property, I can commute the K1 and the H2 around. That's an element of capital H, this is an element of capital K. That product is the unique representation of the product as a product of something in H times something in K. This is going to be the ordered pair H1, H2, comma, K1, K2. By definition of the operation in the external direct product, this is the same as H1, K1 times H2, K2. These are not vectors that are being added. They are elements of external direct products that are being multiplied. That's the same as phi of H1, K1 times phi of H2, K2. Zoom in maybe with the, with the camera if you need to there. Phi of H1, K1 times phi of, that says H2, K2. A little hard to see there. It is a nice one. So kind of, a, kind of a long proof. Each step's not maybe too bad, though maybe a little tricky. I think, you know, with a lot of these proofs in the book, I'm sort of suggesting I might put one of them on the exam, but maybe it would be just a piece of it instead of the whole thing, and maybe some hints for parts that are trickier. Yeah, okay. you know, it's a little tricky kind of thing this way. We saw this before, I'm going to skip over this slide. It is a classification fact. I'll come back to it actually in part B of today's lecture. Group homomorphisms. So this was in that extra lecture that I made last Thursday. Let's go over it again. I'm going to go more quickly than I did even in that lecture, even though I went kind of quickly in that lecture. You got two groups, G and G prime, or G and G bar, whatever you want to call them. A group homomorphism is a mapping from the first group to the other. That's operation group. Does not need to be one to one, does not need to be onto. Might be one to one, might be onto, but it doesn't have to be. Isomorphisms are homomorphisms, but in general, homomorphisms are not isomorphisms. The class of homomorphisms is bigger than the class of isomorphisms. What's the kernel? It's analogous to the idea of a null space in linear algebra. It's the set of elements in the domain that get mapped to the identity in the codomain. And if the codomain, for example, happened to be a group whose operation is addition, instead of using E prime, we'd probably use a zero. 
And remember, vector spaces are groups under addition, ignoring scalar multiplication. And so, and, and, and in fact, in such a situation, a linear transformation is, is also a group homomorphism. And the kernel would be the same as the null space. So the, the idea from linear algebra is very much related. This last new notation here where you see the phi inverse it is standard notation, but it's a little confusing. Phi inverse, the inverse function of phi does not necessarily exist because phi is not necessarily one-to-one. -one. However, that doesn't stop us from using this notation. However, you've got to be careful to interpret it right. It's called pre-image or inverse no image notation. Our book uses inverse image, but I prefer pre-image because if you say inverse image, that makes you more confused thinking there might be an inverse function. So I prefer saying pre-image. The pre-image of E prime is the set of everything in the domain that gets mapped map to E prime. In general, you can also talk about pre-images of arbitrary sets. Here's G. Here's G prime. The maps from G to G prime. You've got some arbitrary set here in G prime. Let me avoid using H or K since we typically think of those being, as being subgroups. Let me call it S for set. The preimage of S is a subset of G. The set of everything in G that gets mapped into S. So again, you can use this notation even when phi is not one to one, even when phi inverse does not exist. And for, and for phi inverse to exist over all of G prime, phi would also need to be onto it in addition to being one to one. But anyway, we use this notation, and, and you should understand that this is the same thing as the kernel. Here's an important fact: the kernel is a normal subgroup of G, no matter what. Given any group G, abelian or non-abelian. And any group homomorphism G from G to some other group G prime, the kernel of phi will always be normal. Now it might be the case that the kernel is trivial, just the identity. And it might be the case that the kernel is all of G. In which case phi itself is a real trivial mapping. Think about that. If, if the kernel is all of G, then everything in G gets mapped to the identity. Yeah, that is a that is a homomorphism. In fact, in general, it's the only homomorphism between two arbitrary groups that you can definitely say exists. There's always at least one homomorphism from one arbitrary group to another. It's the one that maps everything in the domain to the identity of the coder. That is always a group homomorphism. A trivial one, but it always exists. It's not onto in general, but it does exist. Here's another important fact. <coughs> If phi of g equals g prime, then the preimage of g prime, which is a set, is this coset, in fact. The left coset of the kernel of phi containing little g. It's a pretty important fact, actually, and it does come up on the homework, and you should know it for the exam. Um, maybe it's worth verifying this quick. Okay, so the goal is to show this preimage of G prime is this coset, this left coset of the kernel. Which would also equal the corresponding right coset because the kernel is normal. How do you show that? Well, you show two set inclusions. You show this set inclusion and you show this set inclusion. To show this one, Start with an arbitrary element of the preimage and show it must be in that left coset of the kernel. What does it mean to be in the preimage of G prime? It means X gets mapped to G prime under V. 
It means phi of x equals g prime. Now to be in this left coset that, that involves the g, it must also then be relevant. We must need to use this fact as well. And we probably need to use the fact that phi is operation preserving. Homomorphisms are operation preserving, not necessarily one to one or on to. This does equal phi of g. What does this imply? It would imply, for example, that this is true. Why? Why did I do that? I just multiplied both sides of this equation on the right by the inverse of phi of g. That's an, an element of g prime that's got an inverse. g prime is a group. This would equal the identity in G prime. Now since phi is a group homomorphism, it's operation preserving. You can bring the inverse symbol inside the phi. You can write this. This is since phi is operation preserving, OP. <laughs> and also, you can combine these things. That's also since phi is operation. I'd be okay if you did that in one step. Those two steps as one step. I'd be okay with that. What does that mean? Um, keep going. Just follow your nose. Okay, this gets mapped to the identity. It must be in the kernel. It must be in this coset of the kernel. Oh, no, excuse me. Sorry. It must be in the kernel itself. You know, say x g inverse equals, what should I call it? I don't know. Um, k, an element of the kernel. Multiply both sides on the right by g inverse. x is k times little g. Which would be, okay, I'm not doing this in the most ideal way, in this right coset of the kernel. But since the kernel is normal, that's the same as the left coset. I could have avoided doing that if I solved for x differently. But that's okay as well. The kernel is normal. So that implies this set inclusion. Maybe the logic reverses for the other set inclusion. Maybe I don't need to write it. Give me something in this left coset, call it x. Okay, if I'm going to do this thing of using the normality like I did, I guess I'd say it's in this coset. So it's something in the kernel times little g. Is all this logic reversible? You can multiply both sides by g inverse on the right. And that's in the kernel, k is in the kernel, k is assumed to be in the kernel. Which means this is true, which means this is true, which means this is true, this is true. And therefore this is true. All the logic is reversible. So the other set inclusion just reverses the logic. That doesn't always happen, but in this case it does. So these are equal. If you're feeling sleepy, can't follow it. Well, for the rest of class, maybe try pinching yourself a few times, but after class, rethink it through on your own. It's always a good idea, but of course you have to have the time for it. I mentioned this example from differential equations in the video from last Thursday. Um, I'm not going to go over it now. Instead, for the quiz, I want to emphasize a couple big theorems. We've got these lists of um, easier properties of homomorphisms that I've not shown you, though, in fact, this is one of them, where little g maps to g prime. That's one of those. You've got these two long theorems, that's what I'm talking about. 
Before the quiz, I want to emphasize a couple big theorems. The first isomorphism theorem, which you can state in this way. I don't know why I switched to a G bar instead of a G prime. I think the book typically uses a G bar. Let phi be a homomorphism from G to G bar. Then the factor group, G mod the kernel of phi, is isomorphic to the image of G under phi, or the image of phi for short. <clears throat> um, our book uses this notation for the image, direct image, not, not inverse image, not pre-image, but direct image, the set of all outputs of the function, sometimes called the range, but I avoid that word. I prefer using the word image. Some books just call it IM of phi for image of phi. It's not imaginary, by the way. Nothing related to complex numbers there. And the natural isomorphism is given by this formula. Um, you know, I think the statement of this theorem is certainly not obvious. But the proof of it, once you see it, is something you should be able to do on the, on the test. Showing that this function phi bar is an isomorphism is something you should be able to do for the test. But though you first need to show it's well-defined. So this well-defined issue comes in again. In fact, I really like these kinds of proofs of showing something well-defined. So I, I lean toward probably putting something related to this on the test. Maybe not with this example, but maybe with the it came up with, for example, the proof of the orbit stabilizer theorem. I think it came up in one other spot, too, showing the function well defined. If you've got two different representatives of the left coset, G1 and G2, is the output of phi bar the same? That's the issue. You need to know it's an issue. I think I'll write some equivalencies here because I, I think the logic is going to reverse itself to be able to show phi bar is, in fact, one to one as well, if you use the reverse logic. I'm assuming I've got the same coset, the same left coset, two different representatives. Is phi of G1 equal to phi of G2? It better be for this formula to make sense. Well defined is asking, does the formula make sense? This would be equivalent to, for example, multiplying the left both sides by, say, G1 inverse. I could write G1 inverse G2 being in the kernel. That would be equivalent to saying G1 inverse times G2 maps to the identity of G bar. I guess I'll write it as E bar. Using the fact that phi is operation preserving and skipping one step here, used operation preserving really twice there in my mind. Once for separating the G1 inverse and G2 apart into separate fees, and a second time for bringing the inverse up there. Multiplying both sides of this on the left by phi of G1 gives me what I want. So assuming this leads to this, and that means phi bar is well defined. Going the other way, assuming this, meaning assuming phi bar of G1 kernel of phi G2 and phi bar of G2 kernel of G are equal, implies that the cosets must be the same as well. The logic reverses phi is one to one. So the well-defined implication is that <coughs> logic and showing phi bar is one to one. After you've shown it's well-defined, the logic goes the other way. You should first emphasize that you show phi bar is well defined first. And then you say, oh, the logic reverses itself, so phi bar, once you know it's well defined, is also one to one. And it's on to, it's on to this image of G. Phi, by the way, is not necessarily on to. Though in many cases it is. Here it's not, in general. 
but phi bar better be on to not g bar, but the image. Here I'm trying to show this isomorphism. Essentially, by definition, it's onto the image. Uh, give me something in here called g bar. There exists a little g in capital G, so that this is true because g bar is in the image. And that same little g can be used as the representative for the left coset that gets plugged into phi bar to map to little g bar. Think it through. It's not too bad. Think it through after class if you're feeling confused right now. And then you'd also need to show phi bar's operation preserving. That's not too hard. So the definition of coset multiplication is needed. I'll leave that to you. Let me just quickly mention before the quiz this other fact. Normal subgroups are kernels. Every normal subgroup of a group G is the kernel of some homomorphism of G. To be more specific, you can come up with an example. It's the kernel of this homomorphism, which I label with the Greek letter pi. It's not the number pi. Pi here represents a function. Pi starts with P. I think of this as what's called a projection. Projection starts with P. That's why I use a pi. And other people use a pi as well. Our author uses a gamma for this function. But I prefer pi. Map your arbitrary element of little of capital G to this left coset factor. And you can show that that makes the coset the kernel of this homomorphism. Okay, so that abstract stuff. Let's take the quiz right now and then we'll review for the example. 